My name's Alex and I work here at uh, Bloomberg where I've worked here for about two and a half years uh, having graduated uh, with a degree in mathematics um, but I am a software engineer here at Bloomberg so my role is to make a software um, deploy and deploying software is a big part of that so just so I sort of know how many people would consider themselves data scientists software engineers academics Okay, cool. Awesome, I thought it would be a mixed crowd. Um, so, yeah, as I said, I uh, worked at Bloomo for about two and a half years where I've um, been a member of the Commodities London team. Uh, specifically for this talk, uh, I'm talking about our work in the European power and gas sector um, where I've contributed to the models. But more importantly, again, for this talk, is I've contributed to the infrastructure around the models um, and the user interface as well. And so... What I want to sort of explore here is that um, modelling is a small part of what we do, uh, it's a very small part of what makes an entire product, and that your model needs to be able to fit into the wider world, the wider system, in order for your customers to actually use it, or for your, you know, whoever wants to use that model to actually benefit from it. Cool. So I'll start with a little bit about Bloomberg, what we do, and how we use uh, Pi Data technology specifically within my team. Um, and then we'll get on to the interesting stuff uh, about what we actually deploy. So Bloomberg is um, a big company. We've got about 3,500 developers, um, which means that we have a big uh, range of experiences um, and a big range of technologies to go with that. One of which, of course, is Python. So Python's gaining momentum. Uh, it's being used more and more and more uh, at Bloomberg for reasons I'm sure you're all aware of. And uh, we'll just discuss a specific example where Python has worked for us better than C++, um, which is one of the, the big languages that's in use here at Bloomberg. Um, we have a proprietary build of Python that gives us access to our proprietary libraries. And one of the big things, that, again, that I'm going to talk about later on is that it gives us access to our service-oriented architecture and our core database technologies. Um, so we use a range of databases, and um, some of the libraries that we use for those are proprietary to Bloomberg and, or, or commercial as well, and we have to be able to link those into Python in order to use them. So commodities, London, R&D. Um, there's about there's 10 of us in the team now, I think, um, and we have quite a wide range of responsibilities, uh, one of which is a solution for European power and gas traders. Uh, we have a sister team out in New York who looks after the US guys as well. Um, and what they're really interested in, uh, especially um, in the, the modeling space, is the balance between supply and demand. So, the balance between how much electricity there is, or how much gas there is, and how much people will actually want to use it. Cool. Um, so there's various um, models at play here. Um, so supply of electricity, is, in this day and age, is, um, varies on wind and solar and things like that. Uh, the demand for power is very, um, very much driven by uh, the weather. And in the UK, the demand for gas is very much driven by heating. And obviously, if it's cold outside, you probably want your heating on inside. And so all these things come into play. Um, one thing I'm not going to talk about today, but contributes to a large part of our products on the supply side, is the power plant outage data, uh, which is, is really important to our product. So, you know, actually going out and finding out which uh, power plants are, are down. Um, and the supply and demand models. So the supply and demand models is, is where we're going to focus our, our effort. And um, I'll go into a little bit more detail about that now. So how do we use Pi Data at Bloomberg Commodities London? And the long title. Anyway, so one of our big functions, um, and I'll go into a bit more detail about what this looks like, is the European market models function. So, um, one of the things it does is display low latency uh, weather updates from WSI. 
uh, Weather Services International, famous for weather.com and very famous in the industry as a good source of your weather. Um, we have supply and demand models for the major markets, so we have wind supply models, um, we have solar supply models, we have power demand models, gas demand models um, for uh, markets such as the UK and Germany. And the most important thing here is we use NumPy, Pandas, SciPy, um, Matplotlib, a bunch of other stuff in our pipeline, uh, in our workflows to enable us to do that. So a little sort of side that I want to take here is, is to talk about why we started using Python. So when we uh, started on this project, it was actually before I joined Bloomberg, one of the first models um, that the team developed was a wind supply model for the UK. Um, this was developed by the modelers offline using MATLAB and R, uh, two technologies that one, we don't want to deploy to production, uh, license fees, and uh, or can't uh, can't deploy to production for various reasons. Um, there are also technologies that we as software engineers aren't comfortable with, and we're the ones that have to get up at two o'clock in the morning to fix the issue uh, that's gone wrong in production. And if we don't understand the technology, that's going to be very hard to do. So, enter uh, C plus plus. We take the model that the modelers made, um, convert it over to C++, and of course it doesn't work. Uh, it didn't really um, have much relation to the original model, and a lot of time was spent actually getting the two models to, to agree. Um, a lot of time was spent compiling stuff and things you just don't want to do when you're developing uh, a model. So the next time uh, a modeling task came up, we looked to Python. So um, we're a few models in now, and we're going to talk a bit more about the power demand models today. So the uh, power demand model in EUM is a multi-stage uh, regression model. It incorporates the weather data, as I said, from WSI. So this is an example where you have to fit into the wider system. Um, something else is, is responsible for getting that data into the system. It has a strong autoregressive component and strong seasonal trends. And the model runs both on desktop and production. So this is where some of the software engineering comes into play. So our modelers use desktops very similar to the ones you're, you're sitting in front of today. Um, they're Windows based. They are not connected to our production systems for obvious reasons. Uh, you can have occasional read access, but certainly no write access or anything like that, um, which is the complete opposite to our production systems. So our production systems obviously running out in our production database uh, data centers. Um, they've got connectivity to all our production databases, production services, and more specifically, they have to write to them as well. Now, this is obviously two very different environments that we want the model to work in because we want to be able to run the same model both in development and in production so that we know that we're running exactly the same thing at all times. So this is just a, a brief overview of, of the other side of the, the coin, uh, how we actually present this data to our clients. So this is the UK power um, market uh, that we, we currently have. Um, so you can see that you can display the raw weather on the far left there, wind supply, embedded wind supply, which is like um, the wind that people use in their own homes. So if you have a, a windmill in your back garden, it actually has the effect of reducing your demand rather than increasing the wind supply on the network. So it's a subtly different uh, model. Solar supply and power demand. Um, you know, you've got all the, the sort of the basics there, you, you can see what the power demand is, but again, you need to understand the business aspect here in order to be able to design a reasonable UI. So we have power and gas traders who are interested in trading today or trading tomorrow. They might be interested in looking at the two-day view with half-hourly granularity. Um, the opposite end of the spectrum is people that want to trade next week. They're trading whole days or whole peaks, so like 8 uh, a.m. to 8 p.m. each day, something like that. 
they might be interested in seeing a 15 day view with six hourly granularity or three hourly granularity, something like that. And this is what I would call the programmer's view because only programmers want to see 15 days at half hour. Um, so that just gives you a brief overview. And we've also got a few summaries around so that if you don't trade a particular market, um, but it, it moves quickly, the estimates move a lot, um, then you can see that on the bottom there. So this, we're nearly at the end of the, the Bloomberg bit. So what I wanted to just highlight with these sort of real world examples was that the model, although we're, we maintain the models, we also have to maintain a much larger system. We have to maintain numerous databases that hold numerous different uh, bits of data that actually go into the model, including weather. We have to maintain a bunch of middleware. Yeah, we've got systems teams and um, infrastructure teams that, that provide us with service-oriented architecture libraries and, and maintain our, our sort of underlying databases for us. But, you know, we have to develop that middleware to connect it all together as well as the model itself. And we have to develop the UI as well. You know, it's all well and good have this model that runs on our desktops, but we can't send that to all of our clients. Um, so, you know, we have to have some way of presenting that data to them, and it has to be useful to them. You know, it has to be, it has to fit their workflow. Can't fit our model. It can't be the most convenient way for us to display the data. It has to display the data in the way that they actually need it. So how do we go about engineering a model? And I chose engineering quite carefully because this isn't, the, uh, I want to talk about how we go from a model you might chuck together on your laptop through to a model that you can actually use out in the real world in, in production. So I hope everyone can see most of that. Um, so what does a laptop model look like? Uh, and really, what, what do I mean by that? I simply mean a model that's sort of running on your laptop, running on your desktop. It doesn't really connect to anywhere. You've gone, you've gone and found some data somewhere. Um, you know, you, you found whatever old data uh, that you could find. Um, you may not have even checked that you can legally use that data at this stage. But that is quite important when it comes to going to production. Um, you have used, you know, you're good at what you do. You've used your experience to split the training data away from the test data. Um, you know that you probably should split the training stage from the, the forecasting stage. And at this point, I'd like to say something I missed earlier, that we're, uh, most of our models are regression models. So this is a regression model um, example, but obviously you could probably you know, apply it to classification models as well. Um, everything goes around in memory. Um, you calculate the errors, you display the errors, you, you pause to display some pretty graphs. These are all awesome things uh, when you're modeling. And what I'd like to say at this point is that this is an essential part of model development. You know, model development is a creative art, it, as was said in one of the last talks, it's really using the human experience of, of the market, of the physical phenomenon that you're trying to model, um, to sort of guide a computer on, on how they might do it for us. You know, you shouldn't be constrained by software engineering considerations at that point, but once the model fits, you know, the hard work actually has to begin of actually deploying it and, in our, in our case, you know, selling it to, to our clients. So that nice little laptop model that we had before needs to become something that looks kind of like this. Okay, so again, uh, this is kind of a generic model, but is kind of based on our power demand stuff. So the... Um, Energy markets around the world are always changing. Um, and a model trained six months ago, a year ago, six weeks ago, could be completely irrelevant to the market as it is now. You know, the amount of embedded wind, the amount of solar panels, the, you know, even the amount of production coming from um, a given 
wind farm, if it's in development, could be changing, and it changes very quickly. You know, if, if someone turns on a, a wind uh, turbine in a field of five or six wind turbines, you've increased that capacity by 20%, and that's quite a significant thing that you need to capture very quickly. And so you have to retrain the model on a regular basis. So here we've, we've divided the training phase around from the forecast phase. And for us, we actually run our training phases in production, uh, calibration phases, whatever you want to call them. And um, we, ha we run them on a regular basis. Uh, and for ease of, uh, ease of simplicity and uh, m making sure that uh, we all know what's going on, we tend to run them at, uh, every day uh, early in the morning. So. Now here we, we now move on to sort of the data side of things. So instead of having that nice file that you curated from all around the internet, well, our production system doesn't have access to the internet. You can't just go and grab stuff from the internet. Production, how do you know you're getting genuine stuff back? Um, there are obviously ways of dealing with that, but it's probably someone else's problem to onboard all your data. You know? And it could be many different teams that do that. You can end up with many different databases that you need. So we might have a service-oriented architecture around that, but you're going to have to have some sort of phase for bringing that all together <coughs> and actually coercing it into the form that your file took that was sitting on your, your disk. The training data in memory was probably going to look kind of like the, the file. And then you can reuse your regression training from before to actually run that regression training as you did on your laptop. But before, we just created this model. We analyzed it. You know, We calculated errors, displayed graphs, maybe tried to interpret some of the parameters. But maybe we didn't bother saving it. You know, We don't need it again. But in our world, we do need it again. Right? We run this forecasting um, approximately 12 times a day. So again, the way that the, the weather systems around the world work is that there's two major global weather providers, GFS and ECMWF. Uh, GFS, the global forecast system coming out of the States, ECMWF, the European Centre for Medium Term Weather Forecasting, uh, based up in uh, Reading. Um, basically are the only two uh, organisations producing global weather forecasts around the world. They get funnelled through uh, WSI and then they arrive at us. GFS arrives four times a day, EC run arrives two times a day. And they each have two variations. They have a deterministic run, which basically gives you one forecast. And they have an ensemble run, which basically gives you 20 to 50 different forecasts of what could happen um, in different situations. And we have to run the model over and over again. So that's 12 different model runs that we have to do over and over again. But actually, it's more than that, because the, mo the weather itself arrives point by point. So when it first arrives, we've just got one timestamp. And then a minute later, we'll get the next one. And a minute later, we'll get the next one. So actually, we have to, for each of those 12 forecast runs, we actually have to run the, the forecast 20 to 80 times, depending on which forecast we're looking at. Oh, and by the way, the granularities of the different forecasts are all different as well, so you have to deal with that as well. Um, so these are things that you have to sort of take into account in your model, and something that you know, you'd separate into another forecast phase, as I've, as I've called it here. You can probably reuse some of the training data, uh, gather training data to gather your input data, but you need to make sure it's actually the future-looking data rather than historic-looking data. Um, and then we can, obviously, this is where we can reuse the regression forecast stuff from the laptop model, laptop model um, to get our regression results. But obviously, here, we don't have the observations that we want to compare it to. So we can't calculate errors at this point, can't display pretty graphs, because, well, there's nobody on the production server to look at them anyway. Oh, I've been talking too long about that one. Um, so we actually have to go and save it. So you have to save it into, again, probably a service, probably a database. But then you have to kick off the next part of the system. So the next part of the system has to start doing its work. You have to start kicking the middleware into, into that to, to push it down to the user interface. On the web, that could be some sort of WebSocket thing. or uh, For us, it, it's 
uh, a bunch of technologies we use in house to to update our, our terminal software that you see uh, running on on the PC. So you probably then still want to evaluate those errors, still want to display those graphs, but that's probably something you kick down the road, um, do on a weekly basis, monthly basis, um, to, to evaluate how your models are going. Cool, and so the only uh, thing I'd, I'd like to say at this point is that we run all these models on a cluster of machines. So not only are you considering what happens on one machine, we have a cluster of machines to worry about. So um, when uh, we run a, uh, a, a sorry, when we run a model, it could run on any number of machines, and they need to all of those machines need to have access to the regression model. They need to have access to all of the data. Um, they need to have access to being able to save it, and all of these things are things that could potentially be problematic. And again, we'll come back to that in a bit. So some of the produ uh, uh, production considerations that I'd like to highlight. So data needs to be cleaned throughout the onboarding process. You know, that could be by external vendors. So for us, it could be WSI who kindly remove bias from, from forecasts. You know, if you look at some of the other talks like TFL's API that uh, I, I saw earlier, you know, maybe they clean some of the, the data down so that it's, it's more reliable. It needs to be automated and consistent. You know, if anybody's ever gone through a, a file and oh, I've looked at it and, well, that value looks a bit funny, got rid of it. That doesn't work in production. Unless you want to be available at 3 o'clock in the morning when the model actually wants to train it, it train itself, that, that simply can't work. You know, you have to be able to teach the model to remove these dodgy data points itself. It needs to be reliable. It can't sometimes work and sometimes not work. It can't sometimes converge and sometimes not converge. And that's probably a sign of a bad model. Um, you know, it has to be able to reliably train. It has to be able to reliably um, run, run its forecast. It has to be resilient. It has to be resilient to missing data, to dodgy data points, resilient to service failures, resilient to machine failures. Um, all these things that when, if it, when it goes wrong on your laptop, you just rerun the model. We can't do that in production to a certain extent. And one of the big ones that ironically I forgot is the ability to backfill results. So this is a big problem uh, for us actually. Um, we need to show our clients what the model would have predicted had we had it in the past. So if we're trying to sell a client a model in, in the late summer, they want to know how it's actually going to perform over the coming winter. You know, how would it have performed last winter had you had that model? So you need to be able to get the data as if it was then. So you need to have the actuals as if you were in the past, you need to have the weather forecast as if, if, if you're in the past. You have to be able to run the model as if you're in the past. You have to be able to save the model as if you're in the past. And these things all seem reasonably easy to do until you consider how often you just get the current system time or just uh, request the latest uh, forecast from uh, um, your service or you know, you just just save the model, but don't actually tell it what data you use to run it from. So these are all things that we've got to consider, and it's often something that is is that I've I've seen is is forgotten, and and it's quite important. You also need to consider what data is available when. So, um, you know, is all the data that you've been training on actually available in advance? So obviously. The observed weather uh, actuals aren't available in advance. We don't know what the temperature is, is actually going to be in the future, but we've got forecasts for that. Are there forecasts for your other data members? Are there, or are they published in advance? You know, you, maybe you're using some uh, dummy variables as an indication of something that might happen in advance. Um, cool. So, and then you also consider how does it actually run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So this cluster of machines is used by 
many models, um, soon to be used by many teams as well. And um, we, we need to balance the load across the entire cluster. You don't have to worry about that on your laptop, you're the only person using it. You're the only person inputting jobs and the only thing actually going on. But that's not a reality in production. So we need a load balancer that actually distributes the jobs. We need a process monitor that takes the jobs, actually runs the model and says, okay, have you actually started? Did you actually finish? Did you save your results successfully? Did you model the results successfully? Probably the other way around. Um, and then what happens if it doesn't work? You could try just rerunning it, but that probably won't work either. So you probably need to raise the alarm. And I think this is probably one of the most important points I'm going to make is about raising the alarm. So you need to make a decision about, okay, so a model's failed. How do I actually tell someone about that? Do I send them an email? Do I send them a text? Do I use one of these nifty uh, phone APIs to phone them up and say, hey, a model's failed? Um, but... If, if a, you know, as I said before, we run ours 80 times in a given model run, if a single point fails on a run, probably not that big a deal. It can be dealt with on uh, Monday morning, it can be dealt with once you've, you've finished that uh, project that's got this deadline this week. Um, it, can, it can probably wait a little bit. If the entire model runs failed, or the same model is consistently failing over and over again, then there's probably something wrong with the model. You probably actually need to need to look at it. You, you know, the programmers involved actually need to come on and, and debug the situation. But if all the models have failed on all the points, then that's probably nothing to do with the models at all. Maybe the network's down. Maybe we've got a bad machine, and we just need to shut that machine off uh, from the cluster and repair it uh, before putting it back on. Maybe some part of the infrastructure is not quite working. You know, if, you know, have you lost a service? Have you, um, have you lost the networks? Have you lost your databases? Have you lost a data center? Um, all of these things I don't need to be rung up about. Um, someone else needs to be online. And it's not because I don't want to be rung up. Fine, you can ring me up. But it's just added delay to fixing the problem. It's more delay to our clients from seeing good model runs. And obviously that's something that we'd like to avoid. We'd like to get the right people on the job as quickly as possible. And this is where sysadmins and operators come in. So the people that actually you know, can see all these alarms coming in, they can make a decision about what's actually going on. They can see that the networks have gone down, machines are bad, services aren't up. Um, they can make an intelligent decision about whether to ring you or not. You know, maybe there's a note on your, uh, on your phone book page saying, ring somebody else this week, I'm not available. Um, and obviously, some of that could probably be automated. Um, some of it is automated in our case. Um, but a lot of it can't be. A lot of it, you need a human to actually make a decision. Or at least that's the easiest way to do things. So... To conclude, I think I'm running about on time. Um, a good model, decent data, clean data is essential. You know, what you do on your laptop, what you do to prototype, uh, how you go about discovering a model, essential work, but it's only step one. You know, once you've got that model, if you want to run it on a regular basis, um, if you want to, to sell, that, sell the results, you need to have a plan to, to, for actually deploying it. You know, it needs to run efficiently. It needs to be quick enough. You know? if, um, if our models took more than a minute or so to run, the next point would be in and we'd be running overlaps and, and that would be a bad thing. And it needs to be reliable. You know, it needs to deal with a noisy input. You can't deal with a noisy input on its behalf. You know? you need to, it needs to be able to do, to do that. And with that, uh, has anybody got any questions? Thank you very much, Alex. Yeah, we've got some time for some questions. Questions for Alex. Hey. In terms of uh, developing the model, modeling, how much time does it take to make it production ready throughout all the other 
Uh, Would you be able to repeat the question for the benefit? Of yes. So the question was, once the model is developed, how long does it actually take to deploy it? Um, unfortunately, that varies so much, it's kind of hard to say. Um, you know, if um, we wanted a new country added to power demand, that would probably be a lot quicker because a lot of the infrastructure is already there that we can reuse than if we wanted a whole new model. Again, some of the infrastructure would obviously be re reused, it's been designed for that, but, but maybe there's more tweaks that needs to be made. So it can, be, it can vary quite a lot. So we're, we're all R&D. Uh, I'm a software engineer, I work in R&D. Um, that's just what we call it. So. When the model's running on the laptop and you've got local file input and local file output, that's logically the same as when it's running in production, you've got database input and database output. So do you actually abstract that when people are building models so that it's easier to productionize that element or is it basically a case of rewriting though that, that glue when you do it? And extend that question more widely, do you abstract anything else? Um, I think the short answer is probably yes. So, uh, yes, files are very similar to the, 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 the databases. And um, certainly in the newer models, Power Demand, that abstraction is, is very obvious. And we're looking to reuse that in the future. So, so Yes, abstract the file, um, abstract the I.O. away from the modelers, as it were. The problem comes when you don't, not you don't consider, or it's not obvious where the line is. So, some of your your laptop model, it might be a single file, it might be a single file that's got all the feature set in. On production, some of that feature set might be in a file. That might be a modeler supplied file. It might have some sort of dummy data that characterize dates or something like that. <coughs> Another part of that file could come from a database, it could come from the weather services. Another part of it could come from another database. So actually, the IO on production is much more complex. You've actually got to go to multiple places and bring it all together. Now, as you say, if we've ab abstracted it correctly, that should be relatively easy to do. The problem is when you're taking uh, a new model from sort of the development stage to the production stage where that abstraction hasn't been made or uh, assumptions about the abstraction have been made which are possibly hard to pour over to reality, um, wh which makes it more difficult. Um, do we abstract anything else? Um, not really. I guess I cannot not I can't think of anything uh, particularly obvious, um, but I would flip the question slightly about things that you don't really need to consider as a modeler. You don't really need to consider that it's running on a cluster because that's how that that's handled outside of the model. Uh, we we just uh, that's all done in C++ in our case, and um, you know we just run the model as as uh, Python code. So that's sort of done outside the model, so you don't need to kind of worry about that. But you need to be aware that these clusters are busy and they, they've got to run lots of models at the same time. So. Cool. All right, well, we'll keep this time. We'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Alex.